Um, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The Lord of armies says this, These people say, The time has not come for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, Is it a time for you yourselves to live in your panelled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now the Lord of armies says this, Think carefully about your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. You put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The wage earner puts his wages in a bag with a hole in it. The Lord of armies says this, Think carefully about your ways. Go up into the hills, bring down lumber, and build the house, and I will be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You expected much, but then it harvested to little. Amounted to little. When you brought the harvest to your house, I ruined it. Why? This is the declaration of the Lord of Armies. Because my house still lies in its ruins, while each of you is busy with his own house. So on your account, the skies have withheld the dew and the land its crops. I have summoned a drought on the fields and on the hills, on the grain, new wine, fresh oil, and whatever the ground yields, on people and animals, and on all that your hands produce. So that's Haggai 1 to 11, and then the next one is 2, 17 to 23. I struck you all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, but you didn't turn to me. This is the Lord's declaration. From this day on, think carefully. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, think carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary? The vine, the fig, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yet produced, but from this day on I will bless you. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall, each by his brother's sword. On that day, this is the declaration of the Lord of Armies, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, this is the Lord's declaration, and make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of Armies. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come to your word, this ancient text that is inerrant, inspired by you, written to this people group in a strange land far away from us. 2,500 years ago, and yet it still speaks today powerfully into our lives. And we pray that you would open our eyes to see the message of this book and what it meant for those people that it was delivered to and what it means for us. And then give us faith, Lord, to be people who will align ourselves with what it says, allow it to peel back the layers of our lives that need to be realigned to you, And give us the grace, Lord, to follow you. We ask this for your glory. In the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, this is the second shortest book of the Old Testament. 38 verses, just two chapters. But though it is short in length, this is a powerful little book. It has a very powerful little message. A message that calls God's people to put God and his priorities at the forefront of their lives, to make him first. And it's an important message for you and I this evening. It was written to people like us, people who would have told you that God must be first. They believe that. I'm sure we believe that. But in reality, this people that this book is delivered to Though they had the right theology and practice, they had drifted into a way of life where their right view of God and of the supremacy of God in their lives failed to be fleshed out practically in their lives. They gave lip service to the priority God, but in reality, they were living with other priorities. And so God sent his prophet Haggai to call his people to realign their priorities with what they ought to have been. And the transformative truth that this book teaches us, that I want us to see this evening, is that when God's people put 
God and his priorities first. God is pleased. He's pleased with that. He is glorified by that. And here's the beautiful thing. We as his people get to experience his blessing. That's what I want us to see as we look at this book tonight. Well, I'm not sure about you, but if I'm honest, I find often reading the Bible is not easy. And it's often because I often don't understand what I'm reading. It feels a little bit like sometimes I, when you walk into a room and you kind of catch half of a news report, you know, you see something on the news about a plane crash somewhere. You, you know that there's been a plane crash, but you've missed the details. You've missed the context. You don't know the where, the when, and the how. Or it can be a little bit like starting a movie halfway through or reading a book halfway through, right? You have all these questions about what's been going on beforehand. You've probably got a family member who walks into the room, right? And they sit down to watch a movie that they didn't sit down at the beginning with, and they want all the information to catch up. Well, that's how the Bible can be sometimes when we don't understand the background and the historical setting of a book. So I want us to begin there. I want to begin with the historical background of this book that really sets the scene for us to understand the meaning and the significance of this book. And this will be the first of three hooks that I want to give you this evening to hang our thoughts on as we try to unpack the meaning of this book. The historical context. Haggai is a prophet who is commissioned by God to minister to the people of God who have returned from exile. If you know a little bit of history of the Old Testament, you remember that the Israelites, because of their disobedience, were judged by God, taken into captivity, and now they've returned from that captivity. They're back in their land, and Haggai is what we call one of the, he's one of the first post-exilic prophets. So he's speaking to the Israelites now after the exile. There are three of them, actually. Anybody know what the other two are? Zechariah is the next one, and Malachi, three post-exilic prophets. And our text tells us that Darius, the Persian king, is ruling, and it is the second year of his reign, which then locates this book in the year 520 BC. We know the exact date. And I want you to notice something about the time stamp here. You notice that it references a Gentile king, not an Israelite king. And that's significant because that tells not only us as the readers, but the original hearers, it's a reminder to them that they are no longer living in their land independently. They are, they are, they are now subjects of the Persian Empire. I want to just recall a little bit of history for you. Some significant dates that will help us as we come to the text. 931, Israel was divided. Ten, north, ten uh, northern tribes went into Israel. Two southern tribes became uh, what we call Judah. In 722, God sent the Assyrians to judge the northern, the northern tribes. And then in 605 to 586, the southern kingdom fell to the Babylonians. So you've got different peoples God uses to judge his nation. Um, the Babylonians come. This culminates in 586 with the destruction of the temple. Uh, this relates a lot to what Craig has been going through with Ezekiel at the moment. Uh, the, the, the temple is destroyed. The people are judged. The people are deported. Three deport, deportations, actually. And then in 539, you have another empire. The, the Persians then defeat the Babylonians, and they are now the global empire. And we read in the book of Ezra that when Cyrus the Great, the Persian king, takes over, he issues a decree. He issues this decree that says that all of those Jews that were in captivity in Babylon could now return to their homeland. And actually, he's going to make provision for them to go back, provide all that they needed to rebuild the temple. About 50,000 Israelites, most of whom would have been actually born in Babylon, pick up, they leave their lives behind, their jobs, their homes, their businesses, the life as they knew it, and they make this long and dangerous journey back to Jerusalem. Now, upon their return, as they return to their homeland, that for many of them they would have never seen, 
This is not a place that they come back to that is like the first time they inherit the promised land. It is not a land flowing with milk and honey anymore. There are no vines that they get to take over farmlands that are, uh, that are already cultivating. The city was in ruins. Its walls were a heap of rubble. Its beautiful temple was a pile of blackened stones. Maybe just imagine for a moment, we've seen the devastation in Ukraine. Think about those people, those refugees have had to flee. And maybe in years to come, they pick up and they return to their homeland. Imagine the scene that they will find as they come back to that city. This is what the Israelites came back to. But in 536, they got busy under their leaders, Zerubbabel, the, the civil leader, and um, who's my, uh, Joshua is my, my high priest, right, the, the religious leader. Under these two leaders, the people got to work. In the first year that they returned, they rebuilt the altar. And then they get to work on the temple. And in the second year, the foundation of the temple was laid. Ezra tells us all about this. But then opposition comes along. Hostility from neighboring peoples of the land, the, the Samaritan peoples. And they cause the work to be abandoned in the next two years. Actually, gradually apathy took over and the remnant drifted into a lifestyle where God's priorities were no longer their priorities. And that's when Haggai comes onto the scene. It's 520 BC. It's been about 16 years now since the people have returned. The temple, which was God's dwelling place, is still a pile of rubble. It's a pile of blackened rocks. The foundation was likely overgrown with weeds, and the vision that the people had for this renewed temple has now faded. It's long since faded. They were now more concerned about their own priorities. And Haggai's task was very simple. He was to challenge and encourage the leaders and the people to rekindle their commitment to rebuild the temple and to do it in a way that God would receive honor and glory and then to look to the future with hope and with promise. We actually know very little about Haggai himself. Outside of this little book, he's only mentioned twice in the book of Ezra, both times in conjunction with another prophet, Zechariah. They were contemporaries. We're told nothing about his ancestors, his circumstances of his birth, his death, or his life. But we are told something significant. We are told that he is a prophet. He is a messenger of Yahweh. He is the one who speaks the commissioned message of the Lord. In fact, 25 times in 38 verses... He claims and emphasizes almost redundantly that he is speaking on behalf of Almighty God. Fourteen times he says in this little book that his message comes from Yahweh of hosts. A title that describes God's sovereignty and his universal rule. And this is one of the unmissable features of this book. It's very clear, just reading the pages of this book, this is not a message of Haggai. This is not Haggai's words. These are the words of the Lord. Well, let's look at the message then of Haggai. And I should have got, uh, I should have got Han to lay hands on me before the message because there's a lot to say here and I need to go fast, but I want you to come with me. <laughs> Pray for me now, brother. Haggai is sent with, with uh, four messages from the Lord. They're all dated. We know the exact date that they come on. The dates are quite significant, actually. And they're delivered all within the space of four, four months, 15 weeks, actually, to be exact. And I want to consider briefly the meaning and the significance of these four messages. The first one is what, we call, uh, what I'll call a, a message of reproof. A message of reproof. It comes in the second year of Darius the king on the first day of the sixth month. The Babylonian calendar is in use here. That corresponds to our date being August the, August the 29th, 520 BC. And it's delivered primarily to these two key leaders, Zerubbabel, the civil leader, Joshua, the religious leader. It is delivered to them. And I want you to notice the challenge that they are given here. 
verse 2, the Lord addresses the problem here. He says, this people says the time has not come, even the time for the house of Yahweh to be rebuilt. Notice something very um, telling about the way he addresses them here. He refers to them as this people. He doesn't refer to them as my people. He refers to them as this people. Why? It tells us something's wrong in the relationship, doesn't it? He calls them this people because they're not acting like God's people here. They might be back in the land, but they are still the same old Israel that were judged and exiled. And so the Lord distances himself with with this cold, detached way of speaking to them. What is the problem? What's the problem going on here? The problem is, is that God's house, the temple, is in ruins and that the people are doing nothing about it. They say that the time hasn't come yet. They accepted that the temple needed to be rebuilt, but now is not the best time. I mean, things are tough for us right now. We are struggling to put food on the table. We're struggling to clothe ourselves. We're doing all we can just to survive here. It's not the best time. Times are tough. This was their excuse, and in reality, they were doing it tough. Things were really tough. But what they didn't realize is that God was the one who was orchestrating the circumstances that made their life so tough. The real problem here is not an issue of timing. The problem was an issue of priorities. They rejected, they neglected the house of God. But notice verse 4 says they didn't neglect their own houses. God says to them, can you hear the sarcasm here? Is it time for you yourselves to live in your paneled houses while this house lies waste? Apparently for the last 14 years, they had found not only the time, but also the means to take care of their own houses and to make them quite comfortable. Well, God's house remained a pile of rubble. Notice verse 9, it says, My house which lies waste, while each of you runs to your own house. You're so eager about looking after yourselves, but my house lies desolate. They put their own interests ahead of the Lord. That was the problem. This is the age-old problem, isn't it? Whether it's 520 BC or 2023. It doesn't matter what the date is, the situation. It's always the same. It's never changed. We have time for everything that has to do with us. But we don't have time for the things of God. You know, sometimes our problem is, is that we say yes to just too many things. We make our lives so busy, often with good things, sometimes though not the best things, or the ones that we're really called to do. And often what happens is God is the one who is crowded out by our busyness. We've got no time for his word, for prayer. We've got no time to serve the body of Christ or to build that relationship with an unsaved workmate or a friend or a neighbor. And so the Lord says to them here, consider your ways. Stop and look at your lives. This phrase appears five times in this little book. Consider your ways. Stop and look how you've been living and notice what's been happening. Notice the consequences, the circumstances. You have been struggling to meet the basic needs of your life. You barely have enough food, drink, and clothing. You've been working hard, but it's a little bit like putting wages into a bag with holes. Notice verse 9. He says, you look for much. They've been planting, they've been putting all the seed in the ground, hoping that they would get a great harvest for it. But behold, it comes to little, and you bring it home, and look what happens. I blow it away, declares Yahweh of hosts, because of my house which lies waste, while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, Because of you, 
The sky has restrained its dew and the earth has restrained its produce. And I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil and what the ground brings forth, on men, on cattle and on all the labor of your hands. Do you see there was a direct correlation, a de- direct connection between their neglect of the temple and the drought that, that they were experiencing. This wasn't the result of climate change. It wasn't El Nino. It wasn't some natural kind of phenomenon. God said, I did this. I did it. I brought the drought. I think it's remarkable here, isn't it? That the elements of nature obey the voice of Almighty God. But his own people do not. Notice chapter 2, verse 17, I struck you. I struck you, and every work of your hands with scorching wind, mildew, and hail. Spurgeon says that our God has a method in providence by which he can succeed our endeavors beyond our expectation or can defeat our plans to our confusion and dismay. And by a turn of his hand, he can steer our vessel in a profitable channel or he can run it aground in poverty and bankruptcy. God was the one behind these circumstances. And notice the statement in 2.17. He said, I did all these things, yet you did not come back to me. You didn't come back to me. This is the issue. You need to come back to me. You need to put me first. You need to realign your lives. Repent and put me first. Sometimes in our Christian walk, we can foolishly wander into times of disobedience or indifference to the Lord. We can get lazy and sloppy with our Bible reading and prayer or our commitment to church. Our priorities can get flipped and we allow our lives to drift towards the world. And in the process, we can cause great distress in our lives. But behind the scenes, even as Zach said, there is a loving God who is disciplining us, orchestrating circumstances in our lives to get our attention, to call us back to Him. And if that's... The description of your life right now as a Christian, then the Lord says to you, consider your ways. Consider the folly of your ways and return to me in humble repentance. And let my priorities be your priorities. Notice the Lord gives his prescription to the problem. He says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and rebuild the house of God that I may be pleased and that I may be glorified, says Yahweh. Go and get the supplies that you need and get to work and build my temple. They had all the stone they needed, but if you like settlers of Catan, you know that you can't build much without stone and lumber, right? You need lumber as well. They didn't have the wood. Where did the wood go? It's interesting because if you read Ezra chapter 6, it says that Cyrus provided everything they needed. They had all the wood that they needed. We're not told here what happened to the wood, I wonder. But go and get the wood. And notice the two results that come from this. Go and rebuild the temple so that I may be pleased. And so that I may be glorified. Well, notice the people's response that comes in. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people. Look at this. They listened to the voice of Yahweh their God. In the words of Haggai the prophet, as Yahweh their God had sent him. And the people feared Yahweh. What a great response. They listened and they feared This is how we should always respond to God's word. To receive it humbly with conviction and obediently allow it to reorient our lives and to reset our reverence for God. 
there was a distinct change in their attitude and behavior. And notice there is the dis- distinct change also in the pronoun. Because look what it says. They listened to the voice of Yahweh, their God. Remember back in verse 2, it was this people. Now there, is, uh, now there is this pronoun that signals that the relationship with the Lord has been restored. They are his people again. And then verse 13, Haggai, the messenger of Yahweh, spoke by the commissioned messenger of Yahweh to the people, saying, I love these four words. What a great, what a great promise here. What a great encouragement to them. He says, I am with you. Four words that must have meant so much to them. God is with them. And then in verse 14, the Lord, the Lord stirred them into action through his word and through his messenger. He, he stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they did work on the house of Yahweh, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Now, about seven weeks after this first message of reproof, Haggai's then sent with a second message from the Lord. This is a word of encouragement. It comes on the 21st of the seventh month. They've only been working for four weeks, and already discouragement has set in. The seventh month was a month of celebrations. There were three significant feasts, a little bit like public holidays for us. And if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to build something and these public holidays come around, you know that's going to delay the work. It's going to stifle the work. And so progress was slow and it was interrupted. And this message comes on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It should have been a time that the people come together and were celebrating and rejoicing Remembering, remembering God's provision for them as they looked back to how he provided for them during the wilderness wanderings. But they were discouraged. Perhaps they were wondering, is God really with us like he had been back then when we were on our way coming out of Egypt and we were on our way to the land of milk and honey? Is he really with us? The discouragement came about because apparently it's been 66 years since the temple was destroyed, but there were some older people who were alive back then and saw this first temple. They saw Solomon's temple before it was destroyed. And it's become clear to them as they're rebuilding this temple and they're doing the work uncovering the foundation that this temple doesn't measure up to that one. They were looking back and they're lamenting and they're longing for the good old days. Sometimes we do that, don't we? We look back and just think, you know, we wish church used to be like this. It was good back then. Satan will use any means he can to hinder the work. And here, he uses a few few people's negativity and pessimism like a wet blanket on the enthusiasm and the commitment of the people. And so the Lord sends Haggai with this message of encouragement. Notice what he says. Verse 4, But now, be strong, Zerubbabel, declares Yahweh. Be strong also, Joshua, and all you people of the land. Be strong. Three times the same command is given. And then there is another command, and work. But notice again these four words. For I am. Am with you. Don't have a quitting attitude. Keep going, persevere, stick at it, be strong and work. But I love this. It's not in your own strength that you do this. You do this and it's grounded in this promise. It's because I am with you that you're able to succeed in this. You can do this because the sovereign Lord of the universe is with you. You see, they were afraid that God would no longer bless them and that he would be there, be among them anymore. Remember the glory of the Lord had departed the temple back in Ezekiel chapter 10 when the temple was destroyed, but now he is promising to abide in their midst. 
just as he was with them in the past when the Israelites came out of Egypt 900 years earlier and his spirit stood before them with that pillar of cloud by day and that pillar of fire by night. The same spirit is with you now. So do not fear, he says to them. Be strong, work, and do not fear. Three commands. And then in verses 6 through 9, Haggai encourages them with what God is going to do in the future. The people should not worry about any lack of splendor regarding the rebuilt temple. Because Yahweh is the sovereign Lord of hosts. All resources of heaven and earth belong to him. All the silver is his. All the gold is his. It's all at his disposal. And one day he's going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea, the dry land, and the nations for the sake of his glory. And in fact, the future glory of this temple is going to be even greater than the former. Now, these are difficult verses, and we don't have time to unpack them. There's a lot of debate over this, over how we should interpret these verses. How are they fulfilled? And we could get all hung up over the details interpreting these prophecies, but I think the lesson that is here is very clear, even if the details are not. You see, as we play our part in building Christ's church here on this earth, His temple now, as we play our part today, as we proclaim the gospel and we can easily become discouraged because we so, see so little response and we see so much hostility to God's word, it's easy for us to get disheartened and to shrink back even from the task, but we ought to remember and be strengthened by the fact that God is also with us. Just as he promises them as they build, we have the promise of God that he is with us. We can look back to a covenant that he made with us, the new covenant, where he made a covenant sealed with the blood of his own son, placed his spirit within us, sealed us with that spirit, empowers us now to do the work that he's called us to do. We must remember that. And we too are to look to the future, just as these were to look to the future. And we should remember that the final triumph of King Jesus is assured. And take courage and press on in our work for him, knowing that we have a part to play in God's grand plan. There is a third message that comes, a word of assurance. Let's do these quickly. Hey guys, third message now comes exactly three months after the work on the temple began. All the preliminary, preliminary work has been done. They've gone and got all the resources. They've cleared the temple, cleared away the weeds. They are now ready to set the first stone. And Haggai reminds them of their impurity of the past. He, he poses two questions, two hypothetical questions pertaining to the ceremonial law. Through, um, and then he asks the priest to give a ruling. And all of this is really just an object lesson. It's an object lesson to show that holiness cannot be transferred, but sin and defilement can be transferred. And then he applies this in verse 14 to the Israelites. Notice what he says. Then Haggai said and answered, so is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares Yahweh. Notice again the disassociation. It's not my people. It's not my nation. It's this people. And so is every work of their hands, and what they bring near to me is unclean. What is he doing here? I think he's looking back to their time of disobedience, and he's looking back for these last 14 years. Remember, they had built the altar. They've been coming, they've been coming regularly to the altar, bringing their sacrifices to the Lord. Meanwhile, the temple lies there as a pile of rubble. And God says, you know what? You may be bringing me these, these, uh, these gifts and these offerings, but they're not acceptable to me. Because your disobedience has tainted your offering. And so he warns them not to think that contact with something holy, such as rebuilding the temple, is, is going to make it acceptable to God. Or make them acceptable to God. You remember, the, some of you will remember the late Keith Green, who famously said that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. You understand something. No one is saved 
No one is made right with God simply by going to church or hanging out with Christians. If you've come here tonight and that's your thinking, then we need to put you straight. There is only one way that you're made right with God. It's by being joined to Christ through repentance and faith. And his work on the cross being applied to your life. That's how you're made right with God. And so he's warning them here. And it's also a warning to us, isn't it? We have to be joined to Christ. But even if we've been joined to Christ... We must guard our hearts against sin that can easily defile our service to the Lord. You see, we can play music, we can preach a message, we can lead the service, whatever it is we do for the Lord, we can defile all that we do by our sin. Just because we're doing something holy doesn't make us holy. We must guard our hearts. And if our involvement in church becomes more like some kind of external religious exercise where we think we're trying to gain God's favor or people's um, approval of us instead of flowing out of a heart that is thankful to God and is offering up our service and worship to him, then God regards it as unacceptable and worthless. And so he warns them here about this. And he tells them again, he reminds them that it didn't go well for them when they were doing that. But while their past disobedience brought about the discipline of the Lord, now their obedience is going to bring out the releasing of God's blessing on them. And I want you to notice how the tone changes now in verse 18. He says here, I set your heart to consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of of Yahweh was founded. They've been rebuilding now for three months. But as yet, they haven't seen any evidence of God's blessing. But now he says, mark it down, take note, circle the calendar. From this day on, I will bless you because you have repented and you've placed me first. I'm not against you anymore. I'm for you and I'm going to bless you. And Haggai's message is a reminder to us as well that we too experience God's blessing in our lives when he is first. When he is first, we experience God's blessings. You know, as our children grow up, we've often taught them that God has drawn a circle of blessing for children. Children are to honor and obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children, when you build your life around those two commands and you pattern your life after those things, things go well for you. When you step outside of God's circle of blessing, things don't go well for you. It's the same for us, folks. Notice then the last message. It's a word of promise. It's delivered on the same day as the third message. And this message is specifically to Zerubbabel, the governor. You see, he's charged with now leading the people. He's doing it under Persian rule. It's not easy for him. The land is a mess. Discouragement must have been a real battle for him as it was for the people. And so God gives him a glimpse of his eternal plan and he shows him that he has a significant part to play in that plan. I want you to notice two aspects of this plan of God. First of all, God's plan involves the defeat of the kingdoms of this world. He says, speak to Zerubbabel. Tell him this. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the strength of the kingdoms of nations. And I will overthrow the chariots of their riders. And the horses and their riders will go down. Everyone by the sword of another. God says there is a day coming where he's going to intervene. He's going to shake the heavens and the earth. He'll overthrow all the rulers and kingdoms of the earth in one decisive and swift action. He's going to destroy all of their forces, their armies and military might. And think about Israel for a moment. They've been oppressed by nation after nation. First the Egyptians, then the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and now the Persians. And later, the Greeks and the Romans. But God says to Zerubbabel here, one day I'm going to turn the tables. I'm going to bring every rival power into subjection. And friends, don't forget this truth. When you look around this world and you get discouraged by what you see and the pathway the world is heading, don't forget this truth. It is running on God's timetable. 
It is running perfectly on his timetable. He is going to prevail over all evil in this world. He has a plan. And notice something else about his plan. It's a plan that centers on the person of Jesus Christ. This is a complicated verse, and I do it quickly, but notice, first of all, how verse 23 begins. He says, on that day, which connects these words with what he said in verses 20 and 21 and 22. What day is being referred to? I believe this is talking about the day of the Lord Jesus Christ's second coming, when he comes to conquer all the kings of this world and establish his kingdom. Commentators generally agree here that the promises to Zerubbabel here, they look far beyond him. This prophecy is a prophecy about Messiah. The signet ring was a, signal, a symbol of a king's authority and his rule. And this promise to Zerubbabel signifies the restoration of the Davidic line, which means that God's promise of a descendant of David who would establish a kingdom who would endure forever is alive and well. It is from Zerubbabel's line that Jesus the Messiah comes, who will ultimately fulfill this promise. You can read the genealogies of Matthew and Luke. You will find Zerubbabel's name there. The encouragement here for Zerubbabel and for you and me is that God has a very definite plan that he is decreed before the foundation of this world. History is not running its own course. He is sovereign over creation and all that happens in it. His plan involves the conquering and the judging of all of his enemies. It's a plan that centers on the person of Jesus Christ. All of history points to him and it will all be summed up in him. And this is a plan that is solely dependent on him. Not only is he able to bring it to pass, but he will bring it to pass in his perfect timing. Until Christ returns, and he will, then we are called as the people of God to faithfully align our priorities with God's. To walk in purity, with singleness of mind and purpose, to put God first in everything we do. To seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. To put his work and his interests ahead of our own. And until we do this, we do not experience God's pleasing, his pleasure with us, and we do not bring him glory. Friends, he is building his temple today, the church, and he is graciously allowing us to partner with him. We do that by reaching out, by sharing the gospel with a lost world, by praying for the lost, by proclaiming the gospel, by making disciples and being part of a community of believers who live compelling lives that testify of the transforming work of the gospel. May God help us to do that. May he help us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. And may we find the deepest blessing and richest fulfillment in bringing him glory in all that we do. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. We need reminders like this, Lord. It is so easy for us in our lives to drift and to wander and to find the world shaping us and conforming us to its image more than being transformed by the renewing of your word. We confess that, Lord. We ask for your forgiveness. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us individually and as a church to understand what you have called us to and what it means for you to be first in our lives, in our homes, in our individual lives, in our workplaces, in our place of education, in our sports environments, wherever that is, help us to reflect that Christ is our Lord. And we thank you for him now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to stand and sing a song that reflects, and I pray it is your prayer as we close our service. Let's sing, O Great God.